Hello, Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we discuss important scientific ideas, how they support the truth of Christianity, and equip you to be confident to go share that truth. Today, we're joined by founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we are going to discuss the reality of climate change. Hugh, it's good to have you on the show today. Well, thank you. You know, when you talk about climate change, that just seems to be something everybody has an opinion on. Some say it's real, some say it's not. So let's kind of dig into that a little bit. Is climate change real? How would you answer that question? Well, we got really good temperature records, especially over the last century. And it does show that uh, over the past 70 years, the global mean temperature has gone up by one degree centigrade. So we've got a clear evidence that the temperature has increased. Um, is that something humanity is playing a role in or is it just something that's a natural variation? That's been a big debate. And uh, you know what I've written in my book is that we now have the data to show that the human factor is indeed the biggest factor. If for no other reason, the natural factors are actually working to cool the planet. So if you're gonna explain the global warning, it's gotta be our activity. So, okay, so clearly we've got global warming happening. Something over the last hundred years, temperatures increased by about one degree C. Humanity is definitely involved in that. I, I, you, know, it's, you even indicated there's uh, a significant factor. There's other factors at play there. Um, but I know you have a little different take on this. Instead of arguing about whether global climate change is happening or not, you have a different perspective. What, what, how do you respond to the fact that the globe is warming? Well, the old data would say that the global mean temperature has been stable to within plus or minus two degrees centigrade over the past uh, few thousand years. We now got temperature records that tell us it's stable to within plus or minus 0.65 degrees centigrade over the past 9,000 years. We see a very gradual cooling of one degree centigrade uh, over the past 9,000 years or the past 70 years has gone up back to where it was 8,700 years ago. So, so if you look at data for the last, so for thousands of years, you know, you said seven, eight, 9,000 years, something in that range, the temperature, global average temperature of the earth has been remarkably stable, slowly decreasing, right, right. but by less than the amount that uh, global warming has happened over the last century. Is that what you're saying? Well, we got a one degree cooling over the past 8,700 years or the past 70 years of one degree warming. So we're basically where we were 8,700 years ago. But if you look at the past 8,700 years, it's extremely stable, just a very, very gradual cooling. What's happening is that the natural cooling has been counterbalanced by human activity that's been gradually warming the planet. So it, that seems to lend support to this idea that humans are doing something pretty dramatic and we need to change that. Uh, but you seem to have a different perspective that the fact that it's as stable as it, uh, the temperature is as stable as it has been, that's actually the remarkable picture of the earth. Kind of explain that a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's unprecedented. This is the only time in the history of the earth where we've had such stable uh, global mean temperature at the ideal temperature for human civilization. So I'm arguing this is an amazing design feature of the earth, particularly when you put in the natural active cycles that are cooling the planet being perfectly balanced uh, by the human activities that are warming it. I mean, you've got control at both ends. So, so if we look at the record of uh, the temperature record of the earth, we see that there are large temperature swings, except for over the last roughly 9,000 years, it's been relatively stable. Um, and, your, and your contention is that that's a design feature, that it's designed for humanity to be here. Why do you say that? Why is this not something that as humans, we, it seems like we're destroying? Well, if you look at the ice age cycle, the global mean temperature jumps up and down by 12 or 13 degrees centigrade over time scales of a few centuries. There were humans living during the last ice age. They weren't able to amount to much because the climate was so extremely stable. The moment it stabilized, human civilization was launched and has been exploding to this very day. It's all thanks to all these amazing design features coming together at just the right time. You know, that's a remarkable statement. I think it, it warrants mentioning and just highlighting 
that uh, you know in the in this ice age cycle, the temperatures can change by 10, 10, 15 degrees Celsius over a couple of centuries. And we're talking about one degree Celsius over a century. So this is a remarkably small amount compared to the natural variability that Earth sees. That's true. And people say, well, why didn't God put us here without an ice age cycle? Because the ice age cycle hasn't always been here. We need the ice age cycle in order to have the water and the fertilization to be able to feed billions of human beings. That's what's remarkable. We're in this ice age cycle, which drives climate instability, but now we're in this unique window where the climate is extremely stable. So I know in your, in your book, uh, Improbable Planet, you've outlined a number of things that can help or that humanity can do to counteract its effect on the climate. Uh, you know, and, and typically the, the changes to global warming tend to be pretty draconian and detrimental to humanity. But you have a different take on that. What is your principle or what are the principle you find as you look at scripture that helps us understand what are good solutions and what are bad solutions? Well, that's a unique feature of the book, Weathering Climate Change, is that we can stabilize the climate while we boost the world economy rather than sacrificing the world economy. So it's kind of like the anti-Al Gore book in that, in that respect, if you want to think of it that way. But I'm actually drawing upon biblical principles. The Bible tells us that we're to manage the planet for our benefit and the benefit of all other life, which means that there will be solutions, environmental solutions, where we don't have to decide, is it our benefit or the benefit of all life? There will be solutions that will provide for the benefit of both us and all other life. We just need to look for those solutions. Give us an example of one of those solutions and kind of how it plays out. Yeah, and I want to put it in the context of another biblical principle that we human beings are sinners and fundamentally selfish. And therefore, we need to come up with solutions that are going to economically motivate people, uh, not cause them uh, to go against what's good for the environment. Uh, but yeah, the book is filled with examples of things we can do that will stabilize the climate while boosting the world economy. Uh, one that we can put into effect right away uh, is change the way we manage our forests. I mean, there's a lot of concern that we're going to wipe out the Amazon jungle. And if we do that, it will be utterly catastrophic, not just for Brazil, but the entire human species. And so what I suggest in the book is we need to be able to educate those people there that getting rid of the forest and converting it to pasture land is a bad idea. The soil is not rich enough to build sustained pasture for cattle but it's plenty good enough for sustaining the jungle. And if you actually harvest the jungle in the right way, where you're removing the older trees that are on the verge of dying, decaying, and releasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, harvest those trees. They're the most valuable trees in the jungle anyway. You're gonna make the most money, but replace those trees with younger trees. And we know that the younger trees grow much faster. And so they're actually going to pull more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere than if you leave the jungle alone. And I know that you like national parks. I do too. But when you visit those national parks, look at all the dead trees. The problem was we stopped forestry there, uh, lumbering. What we need to do instead is selectively pull up the trees that are on the verge of dying. Now we're going to have a healthy forest there. The wildlife is going to love it. And the tourists are going to love it. And so everybody wins. Uh, so I'm all in favor of a time when the tourists aren't going there anyway. Let's selectively take out the trees that are causing a problem for the forest. Yeah, I think that's a, a remarkable perspective, Hugh, and I thank you for being on the show and sharing today. Hey, you're welcome. You know, when you raise the issue of climate change, people are highly polarized on it. But what I find remarkable is that the Bible actually has good principles that help us deal with this in a way that takes care of humanity and of creation. In fact, God charged us to be fruitful and multiply, take care of humanity, and rule over and subdue the earth to take care of creation. You know, I would encourage you to go to, uh, go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's blog on this. It's called, Is Climate Change Real? Are Economic Sacrifices Needed to Deal With It? We'll give you great tools to understand what some of these tools are of how to take care of creation and humanity, but also equip you to go out and share these remarkable principles about who the creator is and how he's cared for us with those around. <laughs>